Hey, it's Professor Hendricks, and today I'd like to talk about sequence content. And that's kind of my general phrase for things like GC content, dimer content, and more generally Kmer content, sequences of length K, as well as things like how many occurrences of this pattern occur in the sequence and where they are, and how do we do that in a general flexible way. And so let's start by entering the Python terminal. And the first thing we may want to do is define a DNA sequence. And so in this case, we've talked about before about how would I find whether or not this particular sequence has an occurrence of a particular subsequence, let's just say the CG dimer. So I could say CG in DNA, and that is true. And I could also say something like if CG in DNA, you know, print, yes. And in this instance, I made a mistake because I forgot to uh, put parentheses around my print statements, which is again a Python 3 thing. And so you have something like that. Okay, fine. So that, that's, that's kind of useful to see whether or not a particular subsequence exists, but maybe that's not totally useful. Maybe I want to know how many occurrences there are of a particular sequence. And it turns out there's a, there's a built-in way to do that within Python. You can say dna.count, and so any string in Python, you can apply this count function, and it's essentially a method associated with strings. And so if I want to say how many times of a CG dimer, well, I guess there's only the one occurrence right here, or I could say, maybe I want to know, is there an ATG in this sequence? Well, apparently there's two ATGs. There's one right here, and the other one, if I can find it, is right here. Okay, so in that case, I'm able to find that there's two instances and so straight off the bat, this could be useful. So I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna clear my screen and I'm gonna create a directory and go into module five. And I wanna create a script. And so I'm gonna start a script to compute the GC content. GC content like this, how about that? With underscores. And for simplicity, I'll just define a DNA sequence here within the script. That's not how you would normally want to do this if you were going to see what is the GC content of the human genome. It wouldn't make any sense to type it out into your Python script. You'd want to be able to read in from a file. We haven't really gotten to those kind of ideas yet. Those are coming pretty soon. But for now, let's just say if we have a DNA sequence ready at, you know, at our fingertips or you know, ready to, readily accessible, and I want to know what is its GC content. So I want to define a subroutine. So we talked about how to define subroutines. Those are defined using this def keyword, and I need to give a name, so I'll just say GC content, and I will put a colon, and I need to define my input variables. So my input variables will just be a DNA sequence, say. So I'll just say, I could call it DNA, I could call it something else. How about uh, fragment? And sort of like thinking it's a fragment of DNA. And so I want to illustrate the use of variables and how I can define a variable within a subroutine and that's fine. And I could have also called it DNA within the subroutine and it's, in some sense it would have been defined in a separate scope outside of the global. And so maybe what I wanna do is I wanna say like um, total C and total G. So GC content as defined is essentially the percentage of nucleotides in the sequence that are either G or C. And so to get that, I might just do fragment to get the count, I might just do fragment of count how many C's there are, and then how many G's there are, with something like this. And so then the GC content would essentially be the total C's plus the total G's. And I actually wanna put this in parentheses because of order of operations here, that so that it will sum first, so make sure that I divide the sum divided by, and I need something to define the total number of characters in this input sequence. Well, the total number of characters is the length. So the len function can be used here. Fragment. And then lastly, I might want to multiply by 100 to put my answer in percentage, as is typically done. And so now I've defined this subroutine, and then there's actually one more thing I need to do, and that is return the value. So any sort of subroutine that's defined to be a function, you need to return the value. Not all subroutines are functions. Um, some subroutines just simply print values, for example. But if a subroutine returns a value, it is a function. 
and I want to define that. And so there it is, it returns the GC content. And so I could say, for example, I could say print um, in parentheses and say the DNA sequence has a GC content of space, and then maybe I'll put parentheses to define the GC content. And I can go ahead and type the um, subroutine's name directly into the print statement, put another comma. And what I'll do is I'll put another set of quotes and put a percent, percent sign so that the percent will be print, printed after that particular variable. Okay, so let's try that. Save, and I'm going to run. And there it is. The only thing that may be not so great here is the fact that it's printing out a long string of decimals, and maybe I don't want that. I'll quickly show you how to do that. So I might want to um, use a formatted print statement, and maybe I can do that right here. Let me see if I can get that to work. I think if I do print and then remove this, and then at the risk of being confusing, I'm going to put percent %f, and I'm going to put 0.2 here. And so this is a special use of the percent sign. In this case, for this formatted print, I'm defining a placeholder for the GC content. And it is a F indicates that it's a floating point. And so this placeholder here that I'm highlighting right now is distinct from this percent sign after it. The percent sign after it is only there because I'm trying to print this as a percentage. So that percent sign has absolutely nothing to do with this formatted printing. I want to clarify that. In fact, let me just go ahead and type the word percent to make that abundantly clear. And that it is this percent sign point two F is what I'm focusing on. So the point two says only keep the first two decimal points of this floating point number that I'm printing. And this other percent sign um, is a special percent sign that's used in formatted printing to link the tuple that comes after it to the corresponding formatted variables that are going in my print statement, in this case, the percent two F. So let's try this, let's see if this works. Save this. And I got an error, so okay, so I did something wrong. Let's see. Okay, so I have to define, a, 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 okay, so that's that's it. So I have to do GC, I'll just do, do a variable with the same name, I guess, and see if that, I'll just do just G, GC, I'll just call it GC. So now I have a variable that's a, that's a real number variable as opposed to a function that, that simply calls that. And so there it is. So now I have 51.6%. And the reason why I wrote out percent is to avoid confusion because there's already two percent signs in this print statement, none of which are directly related to actual percentages. This is to indicate the start of this formatted variable, in this case, percent, 0.2 F, to indicate that it's a floating point number that I want to only express two decimal points and the percent is always there at the beginning of these formatted print statements. This percent sign here is the special symbol that links this tuple of values that I'm providing in the parentheses to the formatted print variables. And so in other words, I could put something like here, I could say, and is of, of length, and then put another placeholder, in this case, percent D for digit, and then put a new line. And so to, to, to care, take care of that, I'll put another variable called length here, as opposed to the, you know, as opposed to the function len. So there I have it. So now I have a tuple defined with two entries, GC, which is a float, and len, which is an int, and the percent point two F is indicating the float, and the percent D is indicating the int. So D for digit, and so I'll save that, and I'll try to run this, and there it is, and is of length 43. Okay, oof, length, apparently I didn't type of correctly, I have an extra O because it was running off the page. Okay, so that should do it. And there you have it. So this is all well and good. This is just the start of something. So how about if I want to do something more advanced? So let me open up my script. And at the risk of um, being confusing here, I'm going to add more functionality to the script that's not related to GC content. And what I want to do is I want to be able to loop through this DNA sequence and print out the number of occurrences of a given pattern. And so I want to do this in a more generalized setting. And so maybe I want to do, um, I want to import something. I want to import RE. And so RE stands for regular expression. This is the, 
the next level of finding sequence content. So we, we already saw in. You can check the presence or absence of a k-mer using the in function. You, we then saw using count. The count function allows you to count the number of occurrences of function. So let's use something even more general and find regular expressions in general. So there's two easy ways of using regular expressions. So the re.search will tell me whether there's one instance of a pattern and it find the, the first occurrence of that pattern. So for example, I might start a search and I might say re.search and might have that assigned to a variable called match and say re.search in my pattern. Maybe my pattern is ATG and my um, sequence is DNA. Let me see if this works. So then if I say if match print, and then I'm gonna do match.start, match.end. And so what I'm gonna do, what I'm essentially showing you is that this particular special object returned by re.search is a special type of object. Let's call it a match object. And what it does is it basically defines the substring of that match, uh, parentheses again. It's basically a Python 3 thing that I'm not totally used to yet. Okay, so there we have it. There's something, nothing printed. So what happened was in this instance, there was no occurrence of ATG apparently. But wait a minute, I thought we said there was, so that was the other sequence. So apparently there's no occurrence of ATG. So let's add an occurrence of ATG. I'm just going to change this ATC to an ATG. That's going to change the GC content, and there it is. So now it says here 811. So if you go back to the original sequence, so 811 is defined here. So 811, this would be position 8, 9, 10. So you notice that 11 is actually 8 plus 3. It's actually one more. It's this, it's this G right here. So in other words, 8, 9, 10, 11. So the the start and end defined by this match object, therefore, are done in such a way that it's consistent with Python substrings. Indeed, we can validate that by typing out a third print statement and say DNA of and define that substring, which is going to be match.start and match.end. I forgot to put a colon. There should have been a colon as opposed to the comma which is what you might do for a range function. So there it is. So colon for substrings, and there's our ATG, so I was able to find it. Now, the other thing that's really useful about this is we can search for um, multiple occurrences of a pattern. So re.search was just one instance of a pattern. So maybe I want to say, if there's a match, I want to print every occurrence of a pattern. So let's try that. So I'm going to put, um, call this match one, match one, and say, if there's match one, and then maybe what I'll do is I'll change my search. And I want to change to show you a more general example. And so I want to search for stop codon. Or more specifically, I want to search for a trinucleotide that matches the stop codon. Meaning, it could be either a TGA, TAA, or TAG. And I'm separating these with these vertical bars called pipes. And the reason why I'm distinguishing from a trinucleotide that matches a stop codon from a stop codon is... There's lots of TAGs in a, in a transcript, but only one of them is typically the functional stop codon. So similarly, there are many AUGs in, a, in an RNA, but it's typically only one true start codon. So we want to distinguish from triplets that match AUG from the actual start codon, and likewise with stop codons. So here I'm searching for a regular expression, and, and I'm using these vertical bars as pipes to indicate or that it can match this pattern, or this pattern, or this pattern. Okay, so now if the match one is true, and it does go into this statement, then I want to do a for loop. So the way I would do a for loop is I would say for match two in read.find iter. So find iter pr produces an iterable object, meaning it's something I can insert to a for loop and loop over all possible instances. And so what I want to do here is I want to put match two to indicate that this is this particular variable in my for loop, and I want to also update these to be match2. And so what this should do is it's going to loop through and print out every possible start and end position that matches the trinucleotide of stop codons. And there you have it. So it was able to find both TGA and TAGs in the sequence and provides their corresponding start and end positions in the standard Python way. 
as can be seen by the resulting substring that we printed out. I hope that gives you some ideas about how we might search for patterns and sequences. So we tried find iter and search as part of the RE module. So re.search and re.find iter. re.search finds one instance and re.find iter provides an iterable object that you can use in a for loop to loop through and print out all the occurrences that match a particular pattern. So with that, I'll close this video and I'll see you next time.